Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Smith, First Gospel Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, Thursday evening at 7 p.m. and um, it's uh, April the third, I believe it is. And um, I want to greet everyone in the name of the Father and His precious Son, Jesus Christ. See different ones getting on. Brother Campbell, good to see you there. Sister Reva, Sister, Brother and Sister Durham, different ones. Uh, just want to greet you all and tell you how much I miss being in church with the saints here in Little Rock. We want to welcome everyone else that's, uh, that's tuning in with us here this evening. Uh, I was... Uh, talking to everyone Sunday and just I made mention that I I thought I would maybe talk a little bit about our time frame and uh, so many people are you know are concerned right now with what we're going through with this mm -hmm. coronavirus I'm I am thankful for the fact that uh, we have you know as as few cases that we have in Arkansas and, and as few deaths that we have compared to other states in large metroplexes in the United States. And we certainly are, are praying for all those people, especially the people of God, but we're praying for our government also and for our leaders in government that God will help them and our medical field that God will help these people to uh, to find solutions, and uh, I'm, I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that God is uh, is certainly aware of what's going on, and, and uh, in fact, I'm certain that he'll use it for his glory in the end. Um, good to see you, Sister York. Glad to have you with us this evening. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I I couldn't tell you exactly, you know, what what the Lord is doing in this, but I'm certain. I do know that God will form this world in the end of the Gentile world for its overall judgment. Um, first, Peter said, judgment must first take place in the house of God. Uh, God can't use uh, his church or his ministry to bring judgment on this world unless they've been judged themselves. And so <clears throat> I know God is working on his ministry. He's working on the body of Jesus Christ overall. And, and uh, uh, of course, I know God also has many people uh, out in the religious world that uh, he's getting ready for this last uh, great harvest in the end of this world. Jesus is coming. He's not coming like the world thinks he's coming, not like the religious world for the most part thinks he's coming. For the most part, you know, they think Jesus is coming as a thief. He's not coming as a thief to his people. Uh, he's coming as a thief to the world. Um, uh, It'll be darkness to them, but it won't be darkness to God's people. God, the Bible doesn't declare that. And um, so I thought possibly, you know, I was talking to someone in our church just recently, and I realized that uh, this person's a very dedicated person, and uh, but I realized that they didn't really have the sequence of things down in their mind of, what yet has to transpire according to the word of God and uh, how things are going to come to pass. And so I thought well, maybe I'll touch on that a little bit uh, and try to show that we're nowhere near, we're nowhere near the end of time yet. Uh, this is certainly not the last event that's going to take place. This is uh, no doubt has going to play a part. Um, 
hopefully in this, God's people will, uh, or even people that possibly are lukewarm or maybe they're away from God, maybe this will get them to start considering and uh, hopefully many people will come back to the Lord, and maybe come back to the church. And uh, then, uh, you know, right now, this is forcing us to use the media uh, in a way we've really never used it before. And um, it may be an avenue that the Lord wants us to continue even after we get through this uh, present distress of this uh, coronavirus. I'm, I'm hoping and praying that warm weather's coming and that that's gonna make a turn since this thing seems to act like, um, you know, like a flu, like the flu acts. And it, it doesn't, viruses doesn't do real well in hot weather or moist weather. And, and uh, so hopefully we will going to see a turn in this in the near, very near future. Anyway, right now, I, I appreciate the ministry trying to work, I'm talking about in the body of Christ and in all of Christianity, trying to work with our government and trying to protect our people, being as careful as we can. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I've tried to think of different ways to be with y'all, uh, but I, I feel like we're doing the right thing for right now under the present distress. Getting back to the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming again in the end of the Gentile world, but he's coming like he came in the end of the Jewish world. Jesus came in the end of that world and he didn't come to just catch his bride away or catch people away at any time. Um, that was a full generation. Really, it was a 45 year period from, from Christ until the final judgment of the Gentile world where God turned and, and uh, went to the Gentiles. God grafted the Gentiles in. We, as Gentile, Gentiles being a wild olive branch, uh, Paul said in Romans 11th chapter, that uh, you know he showed that God's able. God used the apostle Paul. Uh, he used Peter first to open the door at the house of Cornelius and uh, put his sanction with the other apostles on, on the calling of Paul as being the apostle to the Gentiles. And after God finished his harvest in that world and made up a portion of his bride, then he turned to the Gentiles. And we're, you know, it's taken us, we're nearly in a 2000 year era here uh, from uh, AD 33 or 33 and a half, somewhere in that neighborhood uh, depending on the on the dating, we're in 2020. So we're about 13 years away from being a 2,000 year world uh, and God judges in 2,000 year periods of time, a thousand years. Peter said, is this a day of the Lord? And a thousand years is as a day. And if you look at the uh, first 2,000 years, from uh, from Adam until Moses, there was an overlapping period of time there. But then, uh, from Christ, from Abraham to Christ was another two thousand years. If you count those as thousand year days, that, those are four days. And uh, uh, and then this two thousand years of the Gentile world to make six. And of course, God created the picture of creating everything he created in six days. And then the millennial reign, the 7,000 years, showing the seventh day of rest. That's when finally everything will enter into righteousness. God will finish cleaning up the whole world and, and uh, finish his work. And it'll enter rest the seventh, seven thousandth year, seven days. And so... Uh, Jesus came in the end of that world back there. Uh, uh, the Lazarus was a picture there of him dying, going to the grave, 
and uh, being in the grave and, and Jesus resurrecting him, showing that life came uh, after that, those four days. It came to the, Gen the Jews first and uh, God finished his harvest there and added people to the bride. And then, as I said, he, he turned the church over to the, to the Gentiles. And it's taken us this 2000 year period to get in a place where God could harvest the end of this world the way he harvested the end of the Jewish world. Remember, he had 2000 years to work with those people and get them to a place where they could see, receive Christ in his fullness. Uh, now let's look here, at, 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 let's look at the scripture concerning the coming of the Lord. If you look at it with me in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, Paul, uh, and of course the Thessalonian church was a Gentile church. And so he's talking to them about the coming of the Lord. He's trying to help them understand the coming of the Lord to the Gentiles. And in the fifth chapter, in the first verse, it says, but of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as to veil upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Now look at verse four. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Um. So Jesus, he is coming. He's coming again, but he's not coming as a thief in the night, not to the church. Now you may need a little bit of backdrop or understanding concerning that, but uh, when, when Paul's talking to these people in the Thessalonian church, uh, those people came in when there was a sevenfold light, a bright light. God was working in a great way in the end of the Jewish world. And those Gentiles that came in at that time, many of them were able to receive that sevenfold light. But you have to understand that was just the beginning of the Gentile world. And as Gentiles came in, and as the church, the Jewish ministry, the 12 apostles and the apostle Paul, men like that began to finish, God let things wane and let the Gentiles come in and begin on a different level, more primitive of trying to receive the things of, that of the early church as milk and not meat, uh, much on a much lighter scale. Uh, all of the Gentile minds had to begin to try to put all this in perspective and figure out the things of God and they didn't have the platform that the Jews had for 2,000 years. They didn't have the law of Moses and the prophets and all the history of Israel and how God worked with them. These people were ignorant. Our forefathers were, were idol worshipers. They were worshipers of false gods. They had no knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they were not able to receive this on the same level as the Jews were, and God allowed that to happen. He had to allow men to begin to embrace this and begin to work on it, and it took God in his long suffering, in his patience, it took him this long to work among the Gentiles and bring us to the place we are. Just briefly, look, God had nothing. Uh, the, the, the Gentiles developed the Catholic Church developed down through the Dark Ages uh, in the early 300s, 325 AD to 538 AD, finally became fully established as a worldwide recognition. And it took God 
way up into the uh, uh, 1500s to have men that he was able to call and as reformers and cause them to receive that there needs to be more than where you are all at in Christianity. And so uh, uh, that, that, uh, that took a lot of patience of God and it took a lot of God working with men patiently working with men and bringing them to a place and God developing men to a place that they could begin uh, what we know is the Reformation. And uh, that's, you know, that Reformation, uh, God's been working on it, developed the Protestant movement. Uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy, you know, the fact that Protestants were protesters against Catholicism uh, and and uh, then finally, the Pentecostal movement was developed. And uh, then after the Pentecostal movement uh, had, had gained its development, God chose out a man, Brother William Souders, and began to reveal to him the revelation of a body of people called the body of Christ. The church, the true church was a body of Christ back there under the early reign of Jewish ministry in the end of the Jewish world. And uh, I, their, their brother Souders realized that that was one church, that was one people, just like a, a body, a human body is just one. It's all connected. We're not de separated by doctrine. We're not separated by uh, organization. We're not separated by all of the different elements that separates Christianity today and that has separated for, for uh, several hundred years now. God's had to tolerate and work through all of that with great patience to bring us where we are today. Finally, God will have a church in his coming. That's how he's coming. Uh, Jesus said the coming of the Lord would be as the, as a lightning is from the east to the west. And that's not talking about, that word lightning means illumination. It doesn't mean lightning like in a storm. It doesn't lighten from the east to the west. It lightens from the sky to the ground in that kind of lightning. But in the illumination, scriptural, spiritual illumination that the Lord was talking about was the sun coming up in the east and setting in the west, that's called the day of the Lord. And this harvest time is a bright time. It's, it's like the early church. There was a sevenfold light. That's pictured in the holy place of the candlestick that had seven lights to it. There was a sevenfold light there that gave complete understanding. That's what light does. It brings understanding. And um, so Jesus is coming just like he came in the end of that world. But first, he's going to have to come in a sevenfold light. And he's going to have to come in a brightness that gets us back to a place that the early church was in when they began to produce judgment. God cannot adequately judge uh, an eternal judgment without having complete understanding and it's going to take God revealing that to men that are going to be able to reveal that to his people. That has to take place in the end of this world. Jesus coming again, if you look in the second chapter of Thessalonians, and I, I don't know how far I'll be able to get tonight because, uh, and then, I, you know, I don't want to be boring. Some of this is detailed to a point where some people don't, you know, it's difficult for them to, uh, to have, uh, how can I say this, that, that they can uh, comprehend it or, or, or put it all together in their minds. It's some, some of these things for men in the ministry that studied their whole life, you know, these things readily are in their mind 
but sometimes we don't realize that other people don't have it like I was talking about this person in my church that 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 had trouble with the sequence of things that's yet to be and uh, so sometimes we have to back up anyway I don't want to be uh, I don't want to talk in a way that is not understood that that people can't understand what I'm saying so anyway uh, pray pray that you know, God will help me here tonight so that I can, what I do give out can be something that can be received. Here in the second chapter of the book of Thessalonians, um, I, I, Paul was telling those, that church of the Thessalonians that he was trying to, again, explain to them in his second letter. No doubt there was questions that came back to him. Uh, concerning his first letter and concerning the coming of the Lord. These people were trying to put the puzzle together, just like you and I are trying to get the big puzzle of God's uh, purpose, his overall purpose, understanding his plan and its fullness and how we're to work uh, and uh, for God to work with us and us to know how to work with him. Uh, so here in the second chapter of his second letter, 2 Thessalonians 2, he said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by gathering, gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or in trouble, neither uh, by spirit nor by word nor by, uh, nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now look at verse three, let no man deceive you. He's telling them this 2,000 years ago. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, so what he was telling them was, don't let anybody tell you Jesus is fixing to come, not for you Gentiles. I was sort of a, a uh, strange, if, if you don't understand what you're reading, if you read the fifth chapter of James, James was talking to the first chapter, first verse says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He's talking to the Jews. He was, he was, he was a pastor over Jerusalem to the Jews. And he, he told them in the fifth chapter that, uh, how did he say that? He said to, um, hold your place right here in Second Thessalonians. Let's just flip over to James 5 real quick. And let's, let's just read that real quick. <clears throat> in the seventh verse, he says, be ye therefore patient, talking to the Jews. Brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now see, James is telling the Jews and that coming he was talking about was AD 70, God's judgment on that world that would end the harvest and bring God's finality of making up all that could be made up in the bride, that portion of the bride, in the end of that world, that judgment, Jesus was coming soon. He'd been coming since the day of Pentecost, but his coming in judgment to finalize that harvest is what James was talking about. And that was gonna happen soon to the Jews. And when you get over here to the letter of Paul writing the Thessalon the, the Thessalonian church, he's saying, don't let anybody tell you Jesus is coming right away. See the contrast? Two different men talking to two different people about two different times. Paul was telling the Gentiles, Jesus is not coming until there is a falling away first. The church began to wane and fall away after that harvest took place and the end of that Jewish world and the Gentiles began to come in and it was gonna take a two day world of Gentiles or 2000 years for the Lord to come 
Now, look in the fifth verse. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. In the fifth verse, he says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That may be a little bit hard for some to understand, but what he was saying is, is that the iniquity had already started and the church was already waning and the church was already starting to fall away. God was finishing his work among the Gen Jews in the Jewish in the end of that Jewish world and there was still time but iniquity was already starting. And he said, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And that's talking about God. God was allowing the iniquity to work because he had to allow Gentiles to come in and they could not come in on the same scale or platform and receive the same thing for the most part that Jews were receiving. I mean, the whole world was coming in. And so you have to understand the Lord was going to be taken out of the way as far as a sevenfold light was concerned. God was still in a measure, but in a much smaller measure. And, and he was having to allow that to happen and begin to work with the Gentile world on a much different level. Uh, God was well aware that was going to happen. Now, in the eighth verse here, it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, he was projecting way down that when the Lord does come in a restored church, and a sevenfold light finally has been reestablished through the reformation that's brought us to where we're at today, and yet we're still not a restored church in its full uh, state yet. Uh, I'm still thinking we're, we're still looking at another 13 years before that's gonna happen. That, by the way, is a very short period of time. And then the last prophetical hour or the harvest will be in full swing at that point. But God will destroy this wickedness of iniquity, of man's ideology, even about Christianity. You see, the reason we have all these divisions today is because of confusion. That's why the Bible in the book of Revelation calls it Babylon. That Baal, Babylon means confusion. And so, there's a lot of confusion today, even in Christianity. But look, God's able and God's working and God's, God is causing people, he's opening hearts, uh, a brighter light shining today than that's shown at any time in the last 2000 year period since a, in the Gentile world. And it will continue to shine until that sevenfold light that holy place, that candlestick is giving forth its sevenfold light to the church, that the church is operating in that understanding and that God's operating uh, in the church in that way. And that way, judgment first must begin in the house of God. We have a measure of judgment now, but we don't have judgment in its fullest sense. God's not ready to eternally judge the church yet or his bride members yet. <laughs> He's working on that. Uh, but the brightness of his coming, the way he came in the early church, in that full divine order of a sevenfold life that accomplished the perfecting of the saints, that work of the ministry, until they all, came to the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. See, we have a ways to go yet. And uh, so God's first, he's working, continuing to work on 
restoring the church and a great harvest is going to take place. And these things that's going to take place um, from this point forward, like this coronavirus, other things will take place that will that uh, will set up the world. Look, the Bible says God sets up kings and he tears them down. The heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. Don't stop and think for a moment that God is not in control. He's in full control of the world and every nation and every world leader. And for the most part, I would say God's hand is stronger on the United States than any other nation because, and I would add Israel to that, but that's because God's chosen the United States to restore his church. That's where the greatest revivals, greatest, greatest operation of God has been that's caused America to be such a blessed nation. We're not a great nation because we're better than other people or because uh, you're smarter than other people or anything like that. It's because we are just fortunate enough that this is where God chose. If you'd have been in Jerusalem, if you'd have been in Israel, you would have been a blessed person among all other nations of the world. America is God's chosen place, but America has turned its back on God in a great way. America's not at near as righteous or God-fearing as it once was, but God still has the culmination or the, the, the center core of his body. And out of it is working today in many nations. God's reaching out to many nations, getting the world ready for this final harvest. And he's getting it ready for the new earth, the thousand year millennial reign that'll take place after God's working. Now, I mentioned some here about the coming of the Lord. Uh, some of the things that, that uh, is yet going to take place. Number one, I mentioned the making up of the remainder of his bride in the end of the Gentile world. Right now, God is calling overcomers to overcome the Adamic nature. That's what this harvest is, bringing, is going to bring about and this judgment. God's judgment's not bad judgment. Don't get that. Please don't. Don't fear God's judgment. God, God, his judgment is, number one, it's informative. It's instructive. It's corrective. And it's even a chastising judgment if need be. God chastises those whom he loves. So God first will give you information. He's not gonna require anything of you that, that you don't, he hasn't gave you to do. He, he's going to in, give you information, knowledge of the word of God. He will give you understanding, uh, especially as this sevenfold light begins to develop. You're going to have much greater understanding of what God is doing. And so uh, God, God will, uh, he, he's going to give us much more in judgment, but it's good judgment. It's the judgment that will perfect you and cause you to overcome the Adamic nature and be perfected in the inner man, the nature of God, the birth of the spirit of God that you've been born of. If you receive the Holy Ghost, you're born of God's nature. That's the inner man, Paul called it. Uh, and uh, the, the new man, he called it. And so that we will have to be matured in. We start off as babes with, with just, he, Paul called it milk. But he said those that are full age are to eat meat. We're finally to develop enough teeth to eat the strong meat of God's word and get the full understanding and digest that and it become a part of this inner man development. And finally, the outer man or the, the Adamic nature finally will fall off. It'll finally die out. And so 
God's working on that to make up the remainder of his bride. Uh, one of the things that will take place, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the grafting in of the, of the wild olive branch, which is us Gentiles. In the 11th chapter of, of Romans, Paul mentioned how much more the Jews being a tame olive branch, see, the ones God started with, they're part of that olive branch that God tamed down through their 2,000 year period of time. And uh, how much more, he said, will, that, will he be able to graft them back in? So he said, blindness in part has happened to the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles become. That's one of the telltale marks that you can look for when God begins to add the Jews, I'm talking about pure blood Jews that's held on to Moses and denied Christ as the Messiah. God is going to touch their minds uh, in the end of this world and they will see those who, him who they crucified, the prophet said, after two days, after this 2,000 year period of time. And so God will he'll begin to add Jews back in and he'll begin to add them back into the ministry. And here's why. There's not another people on the face of the earth after God harvests the body of Christ in the Gentile world. There's not another people that could keep the church from falling away and having to go through another 2,000 year minimum period. The church won't fall away again and it, here's why is because the Gentiles, the Jews will be grafted back in and, and they will receive this message and God has kept them in a great gulf. The, the, that's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. They're, they've been in a great gulf. We haven't been able to reach them. They haven't been able to reach us. But after two days, God's gonna fix that and God will graft them back in. They'll receive this message and God has held them in the message of Moses and the prophets and the history of Israel, even though they don't have it clear in their understanding, they don't have it clear about Christ, but just like the apostle Paul couldn't see Christ, but when God touched him, he said, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he said, I count all of that loss that I might win Christ. When God touched him, the Old Testament, there wasn't a New Testament at the time. When God touched him, his mind exploded with the scriptures of the Old Testament. He saw Christ in every book. He saw the Lord and he taught and preached Jesus Christ, the Messiah, right out of the Old Testament scriptures and he quoted them over and over in all of his, his letters. When God touches them, there's a picture of that. The, the Elijah, Elijah is a type of, the, uh, of this ministry, of the early church all the way to today. That. And... Uh, and when, when God took him, he gave his mantle or his mantle fell on Elisha, which is a type of the Jewish ministry. And that, that Jewish ministry is going to take the mantle of this ministry and God will open their minds and they will receive this before God finishes and the Jews will begin to come back in and God will use the Jewish ministry to carry this message with the help of the Christ and his bride down through the thousand years. It'll take a thousand years for the whole world to finally come into righteousness and to clean this world up. Judgment will take place down through that. That's why it'll accomplish that so much faster because of Christ having the helpmate of his bride working with him and then that Jewish ministry, the church not falling away again, God will clean the world up in a thousand year period of time. The seventh day 
will enter into the rest of the Lord or the, the new earth will. And so that has to take place, but I don't want to get too far off into that before I get to the our world because this is where we live and this is our day. Uh, the Bible said that David served his generation. Well, you and I are serving our generation. We're becoming greater and greater servants in the Lord. We're having to serve this generation with our faith. I've often said, you know, in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, speaking of that Jewish church back there, it says that they overcame by the word of their testimony. And I've used many times, your testimony is how you'll overcome. It's your testimony. It's like a fingerprint. Nobody else has it. No one has your testimony. You are God's child. You are a, a chosen a vessel individually of God. His calling is upon you and you will overcome with the working of God and how he's working in your life. No one else is going through what you're going through exactly. I mean, I know, you know, we're gonna be tempted in all points, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, but no one has your exact life or your experiences in life. It's your testimony and you will have to live it and you'll have to overcome in that life of your testimony, the experiences and the workmanship of God that he's working in you. And so uh, God's, God's calling us right now. This is our day, it's our generation. And we're living in a great blessed time. You know, look, you're, you're serve God, be dedicated to serving, live for him, focus on God. <clears throat> let him lead you. We're living in a, in a exciting time. Many things are gonna happen in, this, in these next few years. You're gonna be a part of it because you're God's child. You're gonna see what's going on in this world. We're no longer living in just a little, little town. We don't know what's going on. The media has got us the world exposure is upon us. We live in a glass house. And so you're part of this. Embrace it. Uh, embrace God in it. Don't be distracted by the things of the world. Realize that God's in control. He's in control of your life. Let him, let him work in your life and let him finish his work in you however he sees fit to do it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm getting older in age and I, I don't know if I'll be able to live long enough to see all I want to see that God's going to do. But I do want to project and I would like to be able to, to hand off my torch or my wand, so to speak, in this race to those that are, that are running this race also that can take it to the next to the finality. And then I'm not fearful because I have a great hope in the resurrection of the just. I intend to live a just life. And if I die, I intend to resurrect with the just. So I have great hope of righteousness in this world. Now, let's get back a little bit about what we're looking at here. Not only is God getting ready, the church ready for this harvest time and for the, uh, this great operation of, of finishing the work and making up the remainder of his bride, but he's getting the world ready for judgment also. And so one of the things that has not happened that is going to happen is in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation where there's a two-horned beast that's going to make an image to the beast. Now, see, there's already a beast power. There's been a seven-headed, there was a, the, the book of Revelation shows a seven-headed beast. Um, and uh, so there's been, 
and those beasts are world powers. Those are dragon powers. This dragon had seven heads. And so Egypt, of course, were the first. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, both pagan and, and papal. And then and those are all world leaders, dragon powers. That's where civil and religious powers come together to rule the world. We haven't lived in our lifetime under a dragon power. That's going to be set up again. Look in the, in, uh, see how much time we got left here. In the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations, I may have to continue this. I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I probably, I never do get as far into it as, as I think I could possibly. But, in the 13th chapter and in the 11th verse, let's, let's, let me just read just a few verses. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So there's a dragon power coming. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I'll try to watch if there's any questions come up. I'm not sure if I can catch it. They, it doesn't stay on there too long, but I'll watch. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down and that he maketh uh, uh, from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them on, that dwell on the earth by means of the miracles which he had power to, to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which hath the wound, had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life According unto to the Wikipedia, image of the beast. Live by the sword, I die have by to, the <laughs> my phone, Google listens to me and tries to answer questions. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and the image of the beast, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be killed, and he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, uh, some of the brethren see this as, they do see it as civil and ecclesiastical uh, operation that's gonna form a dragon system I, I, I'll just go ahead and state it. I see it as the United States. It's going to set up this beast system. I can't see another nation or a dragon developing out of civil and religious power that I, just the United States is too great of a power. I think it'll enter into God's judgment on America uh, because the America's been blessed so greatly of God that they're, they would be due more judgment than any other nation. But out of it, the heart of his people of the Reformation and the restored church will come. And, uh, you know, so persecution will come along with this as it takes place, but there's an image yet of the beast to be made and there's a dragon power to come. In that, uh, while the world, while God's getting the world ready in all of that development, to, it, it'll finally bring judgment. Armageddon finally will be the end of the seven last plagues. It's gonna come on the world when the vial, those seven vials are poured out. But uh, right in the midst of all of that, God's gonna have a people that has joy, unspeakable. Their focus is going to be on the things of God, not on the things of this world, even though it's going to bring persecution. Still, I'm just showing you that God is going to harvest this world, and yet he's got to restore the church. But then you're going to see a beast system develop, and that system is going to be headed up by an ecclesiastical movement that's gonna bring all of God's people that are not aware of what God's doing, that are confused 
and many will take this mark of the image in their hand, and the hand represents the ministry of God. Many men in the ministry will join that system because they will think that the whole ecclesiastical movement is going to come together and make up the body. They, they think it's going to make up a healed body. But it's going to be like Isaiah said, seven women taking a hold of one man saying, let us eat our own bread, have our own doctrine. Let us wear our own apparel. Let us keep our organizational coverings. But let's all join under one umbrella and one system with all of that division. Come on. And you think that's going to be a healing that's going to produce with that confusion righteousness? No. Light. A sevenfold light of true understanding of the truth of God's word. And we've had to change on many things during this re Reformation period, and God is still helping us. There's still things we'll have to change on, that God's working on, but those changes will bring greater light, greater understanding, or I should say greater understanding will bring about changes. And so... That's all got to take place. And then if you read the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, God's going to judge Babylon. This whole religious system, it says there is going to be a mighty voice, a strong voice. That's a ministry. The messengers of God that's going to say, come out of her, my people. God's going to gather his people out of this conglomeration of confusion and put them in one body and cause them to have a complete light and understanding just like the early church had to know the plan of God and the will of God. Saints, put your faith in God. The, the, the Bible says God doeth nothing, but first he shows it to his prophets. God will have prophets that will show. Just like in the early church, they knew. They knew the coming of the Lord. They knew the church was falling away. They knew everything that was false, and they knew everything that was true, and they led their people. The picture is just like the people of God uh, crossing Jordan without, with the water rolled up on a heap crossing on dry shod ground. That's a picture of God's ministry leading his people, leading them where nothing of the earthly, devilish, sensual gets on their feet where the gospel's been shod. That, that it's not gonna hinder them. They're gonna cross on dry ground. They're not gonna be affected See, Jordan, the picture of Jordan's in a great swelling at the time of harvest. And all the religious runs into it. But the people of God are going to go across to the promised land without being hindered with all of that. There are so many things that's got to take place yet. Don't be hindered or got, get out, get, don't get your focus off of God on the things that's going to transpire that's for the world. It's not for God's people. This coronavirus is not to judge God's people. It's to get the world. God's shaping the world for its finality because the world is temporal. Everything that's not a part of God is temporal. And God will judge all of that. But God in manifesting himself in his coming in a sevenfold light is going to give everyone an opportunity to see God's working just like they saw God's working in the early church. And those that rejected it, that was the true blasphemy that's unforgivable. When God shows himself fully with a sevenfold light and you reject it, there is no hope for a person that rejects God in his fullness. 
So draw yourself up nigh to God. Watch. Don't be, don't be, don't slumber. Don't sleep. But get your spiritual eyes open. Pray earnestly. God, don't let me miss your coming. Let me see your coming, Lord. Let me be a part of it. All these things is going to take place in the world. It's not for you as God's child. He's not coming in darkness, not for his children. You're children of light. That means you're a child that will understand and know God's purpose and what he's doing. You'll know his time frame. You'll know. God's ministry will show you. You say, well, how do I know? Just get close to God. The rest is up to him. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll show you. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto what? A perfect day. That's the path of the just. Just live just. That word just means righteous. It means holy. It means faithful. It means wise. Focus on the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I've been talking pretty almost an hour. I'm watching it on my on the clock here. But wow, there's still so much more to talk about. Somebody asked me last week, said, I wish you'd cover the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Well, maybe maybe we'll go into a session next week and, and 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 maybe get into that some. I don't want to talk on things that are too controversial because I want to consider my brethren and I don't and I want to consider the the saints of my brethren and I don't want to create anything uh, of course, I, I hope that most of my brethren would be like me. I don't. I don't care if the saints under my ministry. I don't. What? I don't care what they hear. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't want them to hear much. But if if a man is sincere and he's given them his perspective on something, I don't care for them to consider. Put that in the, in their consideration. I just know that God's going to help us, you know, but I do worry about our some of our smaller churches or men that maybe their ministry is not that of teaching or prophecy and, and uh, you know, so I don't want to see their saints, you know, uh, turn away from, from what their, their pastor is teaching them. So I'm trying to be careful as much as I can and, uh, uh, what days will we go live now? Well, I'll have another live session uh, Sunday at 11.30. I don't know that we will continue this particular teaching at that time, but we will have next week, uh, Thursday again at 7 o'clock. I'll have another session and possibly we may maybe take up from where we leave off here tonight. I want you all to know that this is an exciting gospel, the body of Christ. There's no greater place to be. Uh, everything, everything happens in the work of God. I mean, everything from evil to the greatest righteousness. You know, we, we, we're, we're having to take sinners of the, in the depth of sin. Our job is salvation. And we're having to work with them. I, you know, I'm trying to find God's mind on exactly how to do all of that. Some people I would like to tell them, get out. You're not worthy to work with. Then, then sometimes I'll see a little spark and I think, oh God, what if you want me to work with them a little bit longer? Remember Jesus about the little tree that, you know, he dug around and he said, the husbandman said, cut that tree down. He said, let me dig around it one more year. 
I, I, I find myself in that place from time to time, looking at God's people, knowing that they love God and, and uh, in the measure of, their, of how they comprehend God. See, some people think, you know, me and Jesus got our own thing going and I got to obey Jesus. They're obeying their ideology about Jesus. Many people don't have enough truth of the word of God to know how to really follow him. And therefore, they can't hardly follow a man that does have a greater illumination or greater knowledge. And so, boy, you have to be patient and work with people and, and uh, uh, try to see them saved in some way. But listen to me, saints. Keep your faith. Right now is a great time to be serving God. Exciting times are here. You're gonna be a person that's gonna be able, when this is over with, to say, nobody, nobody in the history of my generation ever seen anything like what we went through with the coronavirus. Yet it's not like, it's not like World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the uh, Desert Storm, the Afghanistan issues of war. We're, we're not shedding blood today. We're just having to stay home. <laughs> And, uh, you know, let's pray for one another. Let's remember the work of God. Stay faithful to him. Stay, stay uh, focused on the things of God. That's your calling. Your calling's not what's going on in this world. God's getting the world ready. He's shaping it up. The, the, the last days of the Gentile world is upon us, but we still have... In my opinion, we've still got like, you know, less than 30 years before God finishes this work among the Gentiles and the work will continue on through the thousand years. But uh, anyway, I hope I said a few things. I know I didn't get into the resurrections and I didn't get into the final judgment of the great white throne judgment after the thousand years, but that's a long time. I'm talking about today, what we're going through. Your life, you're serving God. Be faithful to your church. Be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, our Father God, Jehovah. Remember this, saints, whoever's listening, support your church. Keep supporting it financially. The bills of the church is going on. And uh, so uh, Sister Durham and our church told me today that people are mailing in their tithes and offerings and she's received, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna look up here for you and give it to you one more time. Our uh, post office box is 46414, 46. 414. If she's listening, maybe she'll post it down there before we uh, close for the evening. But you can mail your tithes and offerings in to First Gospel Church. That way, we're still working on uh, a way to, you know, where you could do it by debit or credit card online. But for right now, if you just mail it in to Post Office Box 46414, Little Rock, Arkansas 72204. If I can help you in any way, uh, you have my phone number. If you don't, it's 501-425-9842. I miss, I miss the saints in Little Rock. Uh, I don't know who all this is reaching, but uh, we want to uh, greet you also, those of you that listened in that are not from our church, uh, those in the body of Christ, as well as... Uh, elsewhere, those other acquaintances we know and, and that have tuned in these last couple weeks. We greet you again. We're praying. We're praying for God's hand to be upon us all and keep us during this time. And we're looking forward. Wow, what kind of church service we're going to have the first one we're back? I want to be there, don't you? There's Sister Durham put up the post office box number and our address. 
Um, anyway, God bless you all. Uh, uh, all of the elders in our church I know are listening. They're all helping us pray. And uh, we're trying to get uh, get get things uh, in, a, in a way that we can get back to church together here real soon. God bless you. If I don't see or talk to you before, I'll talk to you Sunday morning at 1130. God bless you all. Look up. Don't look down. Don't look around. Don't be discouraged and don't be confused. Look to the hills from whence comes your help. Hallelujah. God bless you all and have a good night. Amen. Isabel wants you to say, shake hands and be friendly. <laughs> that's, what we, that's how we shake hands in our church now. Shake hands and be friendly. God bless. <laughs> Sister Reva's girl, Isabel, wanted us to do that. Good night, all.